Hi, everyone. It's Kelly Day coming to you live from Colorado with artist Robert Weatherford. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me here. <laughs> so excited that you're here. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm an art mentor and mixed media painter. And I wanted to bring one of my favorite art teachers, Robert Weatherford, on today to talk to you about art and spirituality. Robert, uh, why don't you start by just giving us a quick background of yourself? Uh, I grew up in Laredo, Texas, on the Mexican border. So that the passion of the Mexican people and the whole Mexican desert that I grew up in has stayed with me and is very influential in my art and vivid color that I love. And I got uh, my master's degree at Claremont Graduate School in California, and I studied at the Art Students League in New York. Um, and I was invited to teach over 20 years ago, um, just out of the blue, and I've been amazed how deeply rewarding teaching has been for me. It's, it's such a privilege to support people in their process. So mm, I couldn't agree more. And you also have a theology degree, right? Yes, I have a master's in, in theology from Union Seminary in New York. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, before I went to, uh, actually, it was I finished seminary when it was a bunch of kids from Stanford and Harvard and Yale. And I thought, well, if I can finish with these guys, I can go to art school. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's an amazing combination. So I wanted to talk with Robert today and bring him on because when he was my teacher, maybe, oh, what was it like over 10 years ago, probably, um, what struck me uh, was that it was more than just a painting class. He was very um, profound spiritually. And the messages that I got in your class really stuck with me for years. And and so um, you look at painting as what I remember is that you always looked at painting as a very important endeavor. And a lot of the women that come to me, you know, they were told that their art wasn't important. So I guess the first question I wanted to ask you is, you know, why do you think art is important? You know, society tells us we need to go get a job and we'll never earn a living with it. And it's right. not a real profession, it's just a hobby. So I just want to start out by asking you why art is so important. Well, I think the truth of it is that it's a calling, just like they use that term in seminary, that someone's called to be a minister. Uh, I think art is a calling as well, because when you fully embrace it, it is totally spiritual. You are giving from your heart. And I think the way it works is that we, our eyes and our heart are suddenly dedicated to seeing the world as it really is. And in general, our brain just wants, you know, navigate through life and make decisions based on calculation. But to be led by your heart and to use your eyes, you know, the way you use your heart is what makes art sacred. Wow. Do you think that's like certain people are born with more developed visual senses, kind of like a sommelier would have a more developed, you know, taste? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you definitely have to have the the parts that go into it. Um, I mean, taste is a very important segment of of how to be creative. But most of all, I think it's just that you have to be awake spiritually and to mm -hmm. be full of gratitude about life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So why does one person's art matter? I mean, especially if they aren't making like their most amazing paintings yet, it can be so easy to be discouraged if they're just starting out and they have an art calling, but they're not seeing a lot of amazing stuff come out of them yet. Why yeah. would they believe that their art is important enough to keep going? Well, there's a phenomenon I've seen in classrooms, you know, where you have eight or 10 people. And, you know, I am asking for people to put their feelings into the work as much as they're capable of. And it's not unusual for a never, never to do the most powerful piece because they're the least inhibited. And it's really the power of what you're expressing that makes a piece come alive. And you can have all the technique in the world and pieces can be completely dead and just routine. Oh my gosh. So it's, it's the inhibition that needs to be removed. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, 
but you know, rather than a negative approach of removing something, I, I just would emphasize that you want to be grateful. You want to be the servant of the process. You're you're really an instrument that's just conveying this energy of observing the world and and rejoicing in it. Mm, that's so beautiful. I love that. And I know it's really we, we you and I have talked about that kind of battle between the person's head and their heart. You're right. You, and 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 how, like you said, all the technique in the world doesn't get you an expressive painting that moves people. Right. So how do you um help your students go from painting from their head to their heart? It's something that's so hard to explain, you know. It is very hard, but you know, intention is is terribly, terribly important. And so, if you have, if you hold the intention to just be present to yourself, you are naturally in some state of emotion every second of the day. And if you just try to check in with that and say, "Well, I'm anxious, or I'm grateful, or I'm happy, or I'm sad, or I'm miserable, or life is tragic," you know, any of those things are great drivers for emoting in a painting and all you have to do is is claim it you just say mm. well i'm going to feel what i feel and let it direct me mm, i love that so being focused on what you feel rather than what you're thinking <laughs> my, yeah the shape of my mountain is off <laughs> well, that doesn't matter <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you, I love how you said art is a calling. I mean, it is so often not honored as that because it isn't in the Western world making money or something that's seen as, you know, important. And, and so I think an important question is what happens to creative people who have the calling, but don't create? Well, um, I, you know, I would always say, you know, to be open minded that a person can live a, a perfectly loving and kind life, you know, no matter what, under, under any circumstances, if you intend to. But there's um, a missed opportunity. And that can, you know, it's, you sort of want to live thinking, you know, on your deathbed that you took the risk that you wish you took. And to make art is a total risk. And the, the longer you commit to it, the bigger the risk is. And you want to live in that risk of creativity. So it's a loss if you don't claim it. Mm, it is such a loss. I've talked to a lot of women who just go to their jobs every day and or they take care of the house and then they've described their life as feeling flat. Yeah. You know, it's <clears throat> it is possible for all our lives to be joyous, I believe. Um, but you do have to be on the right path. And if you're filling yourself with negativity of I can't, I can't, or they don't want me, or I'm not accepted, then that becomes your world. Right, right. So that's interesting. The difference between painting from feeling I'm not accepted, I'm not good enough, to painting, right. what's the other reason? Is it is it to paint just to connect with spirit? The positive reason, um, you know, I think when I see people get hooked, it's because they feel the most fully alive when they're painting. Yes, yes, <laughs> it is so amazing, isn't it? When you actually get out of that, oh, this is crap feeling and um, into that, oh, just flow, right? Yeah, well, it's a total privilege, you know, it's, it's like a blessing has been handed to you and time disappears. And you're really just bubbling with excitement because there's one choice after another that's exciting to make. I know so much. It's so <laughs> cool to be able to know you can do that for the rest of your life, isn't it? Well, and it does grow deeper. I mean, it's a progressive condition. <laughs> the more yeah. you dedicate yourself to it, the more absolutely it's real to you. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings me to my next question. Do you feel like we are channeling a higher power when you're in that flow? Um, that's the way I perceive it. Um, I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with spiritual talk and I urge people to even consider God as a real part of their life and not just say, oh, I'm spiritual because, you know, there's a necessary hierarchy that there is a purpose to life and there's an idealism rather than thinking that's just a bunch of scientific rationality. Um, so, you know, if you're in that place, you are celebrating God and you are celebrating creation. You're, a, the term is a co-creator mm -hmm. you know, because you're, you're reveling in existence. 
Mm, reveling in his existence. That's such a great phrase. And, and that's, I feel like what we get to do when we create, we are just celebrating whatever we're painting on such a deep level. Yeah. Well, I mean, we are on a rock flying through space. You know, I mean, <laughs> life is totally miraculous. We pretend it's not, but it's completely miraculous. It's insane, isn't it? When you sit there getting caught up in your your, your ridiculousness of life, and then you, you remember we're a rock flying through space with unending <laughs> miracles. <laughs> Might as well make it what you want. <laughs> All right. What is the gift of the artist, Robert? What is the gift of the artist to humanity? Uh, I think it's the courage, you know, to be genuine. Um, I think we're sort of, I think a metaphor I use with my students a lot is that we're all giants and we're pretending to be little mice. Um, you know, the truth is that our courage will go through any barrier and we can make whatever we want to make. And, and to live in that challenge of what am I capable of is a thrilling kind of air to breathe. So it's, it's really participating in creation. Mm. And you don't have to have any reservations about it. You just say, thank you, God, I, I, I want to give what I have to give. Yeah, it's so exciting. And I'm always puzzled by why some people are willing to live in that challenge. Uh -huh. And some people aren't. It's, 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 what do you think that is? Is it a desire to stay in a comfortable place or a fear of failure? I, <clears throat> I think, you know, something happened that left them broken, you know, and so they forget that that door is there waiting for them and it's, it's open, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. to feel, to feel the divine presence is not a, a trick or it's not a convince your brain of this. It's just stop resisting, stop resisting that life is fantastically special. <laughs> oh. I love your words so much. They're they're just so beautiful. I, I hope you write that book you're talking you're talking about. <clears throat> okay, so my next question is how do you encourage your students to let go and trust that their intuition will lead them to the right place? You know, we talked about some people focus on technique or lighting or form or composition. Is there a balance between the two? Um I have a strong prejudice in favor of the feeling side. Um, I think even when you are asking yourself a technical question, like, does this composition work? The answers are all from the heart, you know, because your heart is looking for the truth of something. And it will tell you, no, that composition is not working because it's not telling the truth. So, you know, it, it, being present in a feeling is the most exalted way to approach a work. And when you're lost in a piece of work, ask yourself again, well, what, what exactly am I saying? Has it shifted? Did it change in the process? Am I now having a new attitude on this, whether I was talking about sadness or not? But in, in general, the challenge is if you're sad, what's the saddest painting I could possibly make? If you're full of awe at nature, what's the most sublime painting, like romantic painting in the 1800s? How, how can I most vividly express the sublime which is an infinite challenge you can't you can't reach that in one piece it's an onward journey so when you say that they are re, re need to reorient and reorientate to the truth uh-huh is that truth what are you saying that that truth is that you know if, if somebody's painting a hummingbird with flowers let's just say okay. you know is the truth they're feeling what they're feeling right now? Or is what is the truth when you say that? Well, to take that example of a hummingbird and flowers, one thing I would say, okay, who's the, who's the character here? Because it's all storytelling is what we do. And if you're not telling a story, then you're not communicating. So within that, that subject, maybe the birds, the subject, maybe the flowers in the vase are the subject. But you want to go and say, what's the subject and what's the action of the subject? Is this, is this bird about to die? Is this bird about to sail off into the sun? Is this bird about to be caught and trapped? And so you characterize every stroke with the energy that you're feeling. I love that. Okay, and the story. That's, yeah, that's the really story. cool. I often talk about when I'm teaching relationship, like the relationship of the bird to the flower or the... 
I think that that's an interesting thing because it touches on our humanity. It almost reminds us of relationships we've had with anything, even something in nature. Do you know what I mean? Well, it, it's symbolic and it is, we're always projecting. And so the projection into the hummingbird, into the flowers is your narrative. And that's what it's supposed to be. And that's what makes it worth observing for the person who looks at the painting to yeah. see your yeah. humanness and what you're saying about life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the story because you can create any story that you want. Right. Any story that you need to be able to tell it. It needs to be meaningful to you. You know, that reminds me, um, <clears throat> I had a friend... Um, I guess the question is, do you see anything wrong with just expressing joy? I remember I had a friend say once, your paintings are always so happy. I, I would like to see more moodiness in them. Uh, I, I wonder what your comment is like that. Do, is the truth for people just to express what they feel or do they need to push themselves to express other emotions as well? Well, it's it's like they tell actors in acting class, you know, the emotion has to be earned. And so if there's if the painting is about the joy of life, it has to be genuinely felt. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is that you have to, you know, reinvent joy every time you paint that painting. And mm -hmm. so, you know, as long as you're committed to that and it's happening for you, then it's valid. Yeah. It's just, it's just that we if you make a painting to make somebody else happy, you've wasted your time. I so agree. So um, what would you say to the people that feel like on that subject that they have to paint what people, what other people are going to like? <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, but there's all that pressure like, oh, I need to paint what's going to sell. I need to paint what the gallery is going to want. What would you say to those people? I, I would say, I would be extreme, but I would say that's corrupt. Uh, you know, the contract we have is to be genuine. And if we're not genuine, uh, then we're just a hack. And trying to please other people is a false emotion. You know, it's really just your ego taking over and say, I want to do something that makes people say I'm good. And it's pointless, you know, because the only merit that you have is the merit you earn with yourself. So are you saying that people should paint only for themselves and what they love and what they want to express first because that's yeah. authentic? But there's only so much time in life and you don't have time to be false. You know, you really want to be digging down furiously, you know, with all the energy you have into what's genuine inside of you. Mm. So good. <laughs> So good. I think that, you know, I think that's about it. I mean, do you have any other thoughts or anything you want to add? But, um, and I don't say, I don't talk about God in the classroom because, you know, it's a public space and you want to respect people's boundaries. If someone is going to consider saying, I have a God instead of just that I'm spiritual, is that the key thing is to be responsible because your God has to be honorable. <laughs> Uh, I'm not talking about a God that condemns or judges anyone. I'm talking about a God that makes you want to be bigger than you are yesterday or were mm. you. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So where can people learn about your book and where can they see your art? Um, my website is uh, robertweatherford.com. And uh I have a book if you want a book. A this is book. such a great book, you guys. We love this book in our family. <laughs> it, uh, for the Sierra Club, I was commissioned. And um, uh, I, the one other detail is that I, I find that I'm teaching more history in my art courses as time goes on. And I would urge people to just recognize that the more they just take a single book, a biography of an artist or any kind of analytical book, there is a world of, of stories that are really just the same thing we've been talking about. These, this discussion that we've just had has been going on since Greek times. Uh, it's in all the histories and, and it's in all the Renaissance and um, do some study, you know, because it will reward you. And you will find that all your questions are perennial questions and people have been grappling with them for a long time. Do you, do you have any books that you would recommend that would be good for people who do want to further study on this topic? Um, I know, you know you mentioned Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, that's an absolutely bulletproof. Uh, this one, 
<laughs> to be hard to find, but let's see. It's... Color and Meaning by Marsha Hall. Right. Wonderful. Um, and this other one is, uh, this one's very profound. Uh, Principles of Chinese Painting by George Rowley. Ooh, I'll have to look that one up. I love Chinese painting. Yeah, well, <clears throat> he, he embraces in Chinese painting their approach to how to spiritualize the art. And mm -hmm. all the things that we just talked about living in the spirit are embedded in Chinese art. Okay, okay. So I hope that gives you guys some great resources and I hope all of you out there will take away what's meaningful to you. Um, you know, everybody has a different version of their spirituality, um, but I think the main take home here is that making your art is a very important pursuit. Um, being in the flow of creating is a beautiful conversation with spirit, whatever you call that spirit. And please don't neglect how important your calling is, because it truly is a calling. It's um, a privilege. Pardon? It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to create. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Robert. I appreciate it so much. And you guys scroll down and leave a comment and let us know if any of this inspired you. I love the word inspired because it means in spirit. <laughs> Have a beautiful day. Bye, Robert. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs>